Hello my pretties, welcome back. Pull up a chair, grab a cup of tea and get comfortable and let's talk about the day Jodi Arias decided to kill her ex-boyfriend, Travis Alexander. It was the 26th of May 2008 and she murdered him just a few days later on the 4th of June 2008. At that point she had stalked him, slashed his tires, slashed his girlfriend's tires sent his girlfriend threatening emails, stole a diamond ring he had planned to give his future wife, hacked into his emails and other accounts, deleted messages, spied on him by peeping through his windows, crawled through his doggy door, sleeping on his couch while he slept in his bed completely unaware, and followed him on dates with other women. He had written in an email to a friend before his death that he was afraid that she would either kill herself or kill him. But he never realized how truly dangerous she was. This is one of the wildest cases and one that I've watched probably most of the trial um, for this case just because it's really it's interesting I think from a psychological perspective but also just it's very different from the cases that you normally see because it's unusual for a woman to be this violent in committing an act of murder. So I think this was a very sensationalized trial for many reasons also because of the sexual aspect of it but uh, let's talk about that but first let's go back a little bit and then we will walk through the timeline of this whole case so firstly about Travis he was born on July the 28th in 1977 in Riverside California and his dad died when he was young so him and his siblings were then taken in by their paternal grandmother Norma um, who introduced them to the Church of Latter-day Saints. He had a very very difficult childhood his parents were both drug addicts I believe and so he had a very very difficult upbringing and he sort of found refuge in his grandmother and really she was the maternal figure in him and his siblings life. When he grew up, he became a salesman for the multi-level marketing company Prepay Legal Services, and he also worked part-time as a motivational speaker. He was a very charismatic individual and very well-loved by his friends. Jody, on the other hand, was born on July the 9th, 1980, in Salinas, California, she and Travis met in September 2006 at a prepaid legal services conference located in Las Vegas because she had recently joined the company as well. At this point, she was actually dating and living with her ex-boyfriend, another man. But when she met Travis, she was obviously head over heels, really, really fell hard for him. And she started actually defaulting on payments she owed her ex on the house. So he was basically carrying the load. And um, they broke up in December of 2006. In November of 2006, so a month before that, she was baptized into the Mormon church because she decided to convert to Mormonism for Travis because obviously he was um, determined to date and marry a Mormon girl. So Travis was actually the one who baptized her and they were kind of seeing each other on and off or um, I guess on but not exclusively until February of 2007 when they officially started dating. Now they traveled a lot together and um, they had a very sexual relationship which they both seemed to enjoy and no problem with that. I mean they're consenting adults and they had a very tumultuous relationship. They fought a lot. She was already invading his privacy, checking his text messages, his emails, etc., checking his MySpace account, because MySpace was still a really big thing back then, without his consent. And when his friends actually pulled him aside and told him that they were concerned about their relationship and didn't feel like she was good for him and sort of expressed that concern, she actually was discovered listen, eavesdropping, listening to that conversation outside the closed door at the time. So she was intensely invasive of his privacy and just very, very obsessive. 
So they dated from February to June of 2007. On June the 29th, they officially broke up. And at this point, Travis was living in Arizona and Jody was living in California. So like any normal, well-adjusted person would, she immediately packed up her things and moved to Arizona where her ex-boyfriend, who she just broke up with, lives. And she claimed it was because Travis made Arizona seem very attractive. There is a strong Mormon church presence there. So she thought that she would have a community and um, a lot of support and friends there. But instead of actually making friends um, and instead of moving anywhere else in Arizona, she moved to the same location, Mesa, Arizona, which is where Travis lived. Her and Travis were still speaking at the time. and. She didn't have a job, so Travis basically gave her a job or employment um, by letting her clean his apartment. And they maintained a physical relationship, um, both consensually, obviously, but they were not dating and they were not exclusive. Travis was also always kind of doing favors for her. For example, he lent her his car, which she ended up wrecking, and he kind of took that in stride. But anyway, at this point, she starts to actively stalk him. Later that summer, she was spying on him from outside the window of his house while he was on a date with another woman and she was watching as they were kind of making out and obviously getting really angry about it. But who does that? It's so creepy. And as I said before, she would come into his house unannounced. She would crawl through the doggy door. It was. It's very disturbing behavior. So November, December, he started dating a girl called Lisa. And both of their tires were then slashed. And Lisa received a threatening email from an anonymous, wonder who it could be, sender. Basically calling her a whore, which is ironic in the context, given their religious beliefs and what she was alluding to. And in December, during a Christmas party at his house, which he actually told her not to attend, she was discovered the next morning sleeping underneath the Christmas tree. On the 2nd of February in 2008, Travis actually made a call to the police because his tires had again been slashed. From mid to end of February, Lisa later testified that Jody would call Travis repeatedly whenever Lisa was with him and that she would come into his house completely uninvited while they were both there and then she would look at them and then run out again, which is just very, very disturbing. His alarm would be set off um, and then he would go outside and nobody would be there. Lisa eventually broke up with him because he really wanted to settle down and she was not ready to get married yet. And this really seemed to hit him hard. I, he, he really, really seemed to like Lisa a lot. And he wrote about it in his journal and seemed like he was truly in love with her. And this would prove to be a problem. Because in March, he went on a trip with Jody, And on that trip, she ended up stealing two of his journals because he was an avid writer of journals. And she also stole a ring that he had purchased for an ex-girlfriend. And then things really seemed to unravel because in April she moved to California, back to California, to live with her grandparents. Text records um, from Travis to Jody shows that on the 23rd of April, he wrote her a text saying, Jody, please, if you have anything to do with this, if you ever had an ounce of love for me, you'll give them back. Out of all the things in my life that I hold precious, my journals are near the top. It is my life I want to pass down. Please, Jody, these mean everything to me. So much of my life has vanished without them. To lie about this would be the sickest thing you've ever done. To take away so much from somebody for personal interest is something that should haunt someone forever. It's killing me and could never get over it. Please, Jody, I'm begging you from the bottom of my heart. Please, I'll do anything. Jody just ignores his text. So instead of responding, she goes completely silent for an hour classic manipulation so he writes to her again saying you didn't reply to my text 
she eventually denied having them, but she mentioned Lisa to him. And she would have had no way of knowing about Lisa unless she had stolen his journal or stalked him, which she denied. Then to explain why she knew about Lisa, she said that some random person just came up to her and told her that she should know that Travis is dating someone called Lisa and gave her this information about her. Now, you have to understand, in Jody's mind, this story is actually believable because she cannot fathom that in reality, everybody's lives, including total strangers on the streets, don't revolve around her and her life. It's very, I'm the main character. In April and May, Travis wrote in his journal about how much he misses and loves Lisa. Even when he was trying to move on, he said he's sad that his journal is gone because it contained the story of his time with Lisa and it was very precious to him. It's very clear that he was ready to settle down and he was looking for someone to spend his life with. So he tried to move on and in May he started to pursue another woman called Mimi Hall. And he told her that Jody had crawled in through his doggy door and slept on his couch and that she was stalking him because she was actually following her, well, her around and also them around while they went on dates. On May the 16th, Jody sent Travis this long rambling novel of an email. And I'm not even going to read it to you because honestly, you'd fall asleep. And this is not an ASMR channel. But the gist of it, which can be broken down in a few sentences because she rambles so much, is that she was upset that he did not mention her in his blog because she felt like she deserved a mention and she didn't understand why he was hiding his friendship with her. And then basically that she wanted to be recognized as his friend and that she would never hide his friend, her friendship with him and she promotes him any opportunity she gets. And that while they are still friends, she is removing her herself from the list of people he has to worry about. But at the same time, she's cutting the cord of friendship, but they still remain friends. And um, they remain friends because of a choice and not because of an obligation or being nice. And that she thinks this is going to make his life less stressful and saner. And um, then it'll be a weight off his shoulders. And, you know, he shouldered this weight like a champ. Very sarcastic, actually. Basically, just being very manipulative. Two days before this email was sent, Travis sent her a message saying, why have you been viewing my LDS link up account and the bogus accounts? She denied it, of course, but the evidence pointed to her. And she had done this so many times before, so it was obviously her. An LDS link up was, I think, an LDS dating site. But in any event, so he wrote her another text saying that someone with a first initial J keeps viewing my account and then closing the account and then viewing me later with another open account. If you want to sneak around, just tell me what you want and I'll give it to you. You'll get it anyway. If you want my freaking password, just ask. Why did you cover it up after I told you I already knew? Why do you always lie? Why did you get in my Facebook after all these times I have forgiven you? It's the other stuff that is blatant lies that I have a problem with. I have sacrificed so much for you. I've taken so much heat for you and defended you, defended your lies, and you've told others with the lies you've told me. And how do you repay me for giving you? You do it again and again. You've only told partial truths to cover up the lies. I know you got into my computer and erased a letter that I sent to Lisa. You stole my journals. Jody's response to that seems to be that she wants to tell him something, but that it's private, so she doesn't want to write it down. And Travis responds by saying, put it in an email. Jody then responds to that saying, I can't. It'll take literally less than five minutes. It's important because it affects both of us. Travis responds and says, then leave it on a voicemail. I'm not speaking to you. Just leave me alone about it. Jody says, let's just say it's too incriminating for voicemail or email or whatever. Just let me say it and I'm done. Travis responds with, I don't really care. You haven't seemed to care about privacy in the past. Just leave the voicemail or nothing. Jody says, well, I'm not going to leave the incriminating part on the voicemail or anyway, so we can forget about that part. I'll tell you the other part, but I'll need a response from you about it. 
So hours later, she obviously either left a voicemail or sent an email, but this was not recovered. And um, Travis responds to this with so much anger. And uh, my speculation for this is that I think this is in response to her revealing that she had actually secretly recorded them having phone sex and that she was going to basically out him as a, you know, not a good mom boy to the girl that, girls that he was seeing or to specifically probably to Lisa. And um, his response shows a lot of hurt and a lot of anger. He says that he sent her a response um, and that, I quote, I hope you read it because you need to read it. Maybe it'll spark human emotion in you, something that only seems to exist when it comes to your own problems. But everyone else is just part of your sick agenda. Then he he does call her uh, a whore, which is not cool. And he says, if he knew what I knew about you speaking about another man, he would spit in your face. I have never in my life been so hurt, so bad by someone. But why do I even say it? Because you don't care. It doesn't serve your evilness. You couldn't even get off your lazy butt to read it, could you? That's the sociopath I know so well. It freaking figures. I don't want your apology. I want you to understand what I think of you. I want you to understand how evil I think you are. You are the worst thing that ever happened to me. You are a sociopath. You only cry for yourself. You never cared for me and you've betrayed me worse than any example I could conjure. You are sick and you have scammed me. She then starts to respond and basically she tries to manipulate him by uh, threatening suicide and just feeling generally sorry for herself. She admits to using sex to try and keep him close to her and she says that she's not sorry about doing that and that makes him very angry. He says that she's not sorry for violating his privacy either and she doesn't deny it. So he says, you don't know what horror you have caused me. You cannot conceive. You have not felt as much pain in all your life than what you have repeatedly caused me with all your lies and psycho shit you have subjected me to. You have made me want to die on countless occasions. You have hurt me so bad over and over again. I am less than nothing to you. Couldn't you even try to love me? You never saw me as more than a piece of shit unless I was serving some purpose to you. Do you realize that? I hate you so much. You are relentless in your torture of people that have loved you and protected you and served you. And what you do, you try to destroy them. You are the lowest of the low. You are sick and evil. And knowing you makes me want to kill myself in punishment because I'm so stupid. I don't even know if you are human. Hitler had more of a conscience than you. Your words are worthless. In everything you throw at me, it's all an agenda to save your own ass. Just like that disgusting call today. Have you forgotten what it's like to be human? Jody's only response is, perhaps. And that, I believe, was the day she decided that she was going to kill him. She realized that she had gone beyond the point where she could ever win him back, and if she couldn't have him, then no one could have him. Travis, unfortunately, didn't have much of a choice but to maintain some sort of contact with Jody because she owed him $6,000 for his car. On May the 28th of 2008, police investigated a report that a 25 caliber gun, handgun was stolen from her grandparents' home in California. This gun was never recovered. So step one of her plan was complete, get a murder weapon. On June the 2nd of 2008, she rented a vehicle from Budget Rent a Car in Redding, California, instead of Wairika, where she lived, because she obviously didn't want people to recognize her. It's a small town, and people would have known that she rented the car there. She then went to her ex-boyfriend and got gas canisters from him so that she could fill them up and drive across the state so that she would never have to stop in Arizona and um, for fuel, and people wouldn't be able to capture her on camera or have any receipts. She also dyed her blonde hair brown. Her excuse for going on a road trip was to visit a new love interest called Ryan, who lived in Utah. But instead of going to Utah, she went to Mesa, Arizona. She arrived on June the 3rd, on June the 4th, 2008, Travis was murdered. 
His body was sadly found days later in the shower of his home in Mesa when he didn't show up for a trip that they were supposed to take to Mexico as um, friends and Mimi was supposed to accompany him. So when he didn't show up, she went to his house with some of his friends. His roommates ended up unlocking his bedroom door and his body was discovered as well as a very bloody crime scene. He had been stabbed 27 times and had been decomposing in the shower for five days. His throat was slashed from ear to ear so deep that he was nearly decapitated and there was a bullet in his head. He had several defensive wounds on his palms and fingers and he was naked. Police found a bloody palm print with his blood and Jody's blood in the hallway. And the smoking gun, police also found a digital camera in the washing machine. It had gone through a cycle, but they were able to recover the photos. And the time-stamped images um, showed Travis and Jody in sexually suggestive poses, also various nude photos, and then photos of Travis in the shower, and him sitting down in the shower um, was the last image that was taken of him alive. There were also a couple of other photos that were accidentally taken and one shows uh, Jodie's foot very clearly and then Travis's bloody body as she's probably dragging him and then accidentally kicked the camera with her foot. When she was questioned later she had several cuts on her hands which at the time she claimed was um, due to making margaritas at Margarita Bowl when there was no Margarita Bowl in the area. But before the police honed in on her, on June the 5th, um, she went to go visit Ryan, um, Ryan Burns, the new love interest and um, co-worker, also a co-worker at Prepaid Legal in Utah. But she arrived a day late. And uh, June 7th, she returned the rental car to budget rent a car. And um, the, some of the carpets in the car were missing. And apparently there was a red Kool-Aid stain in the car. After his body was discovered, his friends were adamant that the police should question Jody because they said that she had definitely had something to do with it. If she didn't do it herself, she had asked somebody else to do it. And Jody was actually reaching out to the police already, basically on her own accord, because she was trying to insert herself and create a narrative around herself. So, I mean, very typical of a narcissist. But on June the 19th, they first questioned her about his murder. And before they brought her in for questioning, they actually found a 9mm handgun in her car, along with condoms, I think knives, and um, other things. So it kind of might have indicated that she was planning a getaway, or who knows what she was planning. The interrogation itself is famous for her singing, doing handstands, doing yoga poses, just generally not seeming very phased by the fact that she is in for questioning, or the fact that her ex-boyfriend, who she claimed to love so much, has been murdered. In fact, she seems quite gleeful at times. And she also tries to paint herself as equal in victimhood to Travis, which is just mind boggling. <laughs> and he had brothers and sisters, and I have brothers and sisters. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fair. <laughs> like, girl, he's dead. You are not the same. It's not fair, but this is where we are. I mean, I know that he's in a good place, and I know that he's fine. I know that he's doing great. No, he's not fine. You just murdered him. So Jody was then extradited to Arizona after her arrest, and um, she pleaded not guilty. Her story at the time originally was that she was never there. She wasn't in Arizona. She was going to Utah. And then, unfortunately, she figured out that they had evidence that she was there, the palm print, the photos. So she changed her story, and the, the new story was really something quite outrageous. Apparently, 
two masked ninjas broke into Travis's home and killed him and left her unscathed. And she was really the hero because she managed to fight one of them off. And, and if only she had stuck around, maybe she could have saved Travis too. Like I said, main character syndrome. And she told this stupid story to multiple media outlets, including Inside Edition. So prosecutors filed a notice um, to basically seek the death penalty for Jody, And Jody's response to this was to come up with um, her third and final story, which was that, yes, she did it, but she killed Travis in self-defense. And also, by the by, he was a pedophile. And she requested that letters be submitted into evidence, which was supposed to prove that he had beaten her and that he was sexually attracted to children. But uh, those letters were then determined to have been written by her in jail. Um, So obviously they were excluded from evidence. Her story was that they were taking photos. She dropped um, the camera, which belonged to Travis, and Travis flew into a rage and attacked her and tried to kill her. And she was then forced to shoot him in self-defense and then stab him 27 times and slit his throat in self-defense. Because, yeah, sure, why not? This guy whose car you totaled and completely didn't freak out would freak out if you just accidentally dropped his camera. She also claims that it was Travis's gun um, and not the 25 caliber that she stole from her grandfather and that it was on top of his um, cupboard and that she basically jumped up on the shelves without disturbing any of his clothes and grab the gun, even though the shelves are built in such a way, it's basically Ikea crap, where if you put too much weight on the front, the whole shelf would topple over. So if she really had stood on it, the whole shelf would have basically collapsed. And genuinely, this trial was such a joke because the prosecutor just wiped the floor with her. Jody had said before that she had an IQ equivalent to Einstein, but for a person who thinks she is so smart, she sure is dumb. Um, I told him one time that I admired his speaking skills, and then if I ever passed away, if he would, I, I would like it if he gave a eulogy at my funeral because I knew that he would edify me in a good way. Um, girl, that doesn't mean what you think it means. She was also so determined to paint herself as this blameless angel that she claimed that she didn't even think the gun was loaded when she went to grab it you know fearing for her life what were you going to do with the gun throw it at him and her defense attorneys didn't really have much to work with but i guess they tried their best anyway the trial took long because there was a hung jury and so travis's poor family had to sit there for months and months and months on end listening to this um, but eventually she was found guilty of first degree murder and she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Jody continues to pretend that she is a survivor of domestic violence which is disgusting since she is actually the perpetrator of murder and domestic violence and stalking and she is also a prison artist and um So that is the story of Jodi Arias. If you liked this video, give it a like, uh, subscribe to my channel, and join me next time when I talk about another case. And for the three people who will watch this video, hi mom, um, let me know if you have a specific case that you want me to cover. But that's all for now, and see you next time. Bye.